Thank you so much for coming today. Um, okay, so let's start with a few background intros. Uh, my name's Harry Stebbings. I'm the founder and host of the 20 Minute VC. Uh, yeah, really hot, isn't it? It's um, pretty warm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm also really, really excited to say today, for the first time, that I'm also joining Atomico. Um, so really, really excited to be here with you today uh, as potential co-investors. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to you now for introductions. So Nancy, if you could do a brief introduction. First of all, congratulations. Thank That's you very nice much. Um, hi, guys. I'm Nancy Fecknay. I um, have been in the VC world for some time, or I should say investment world. Um, I... I'm a partner at Flight Ventures, which is the world's largest online group of investors led by Gil Pinchina, who lives out in Silicon Valley. Um, I live in London. I recently actually have started launching something called the Inspire Movement, and our vision for that is to try and bring the human back to the tech world. Andre? Hi, Andre de Hayes. Um, I uh, previously worked briefly in VC at Index and Andreessen Horowitz, um, started a couple of companies, and recently founded Backed VC, which is a 30 million euro millennial focused uh, seed fund based out of London, uh, which builds community tools for our community of millennial founders. Samuli? Hi, Samuel is here, and my name is uh, Managing Partner of Redstone Digital. Uh, we're located in Berlin and uh, we manage corporate funds. We do it as a service for them since they're not really able to do it themselves. So we take everything from analyzing the deals, the deal flow, and doing the deal itself and managing portfolio. And it's kind of a multi-fund strategy and being a service company in that sense. And uh, have a pretty portfolio, a uh, broad portfolio because of that then. Okay, so such a diverse array of investors here. Uh, so I want to start then with, as the title says, the future of VC. So what are the assets in which VCs will invest in 20 years' time? Will it still predominantly be the hardware, software world that we're strained and focused on now? Who wants to take the lead on this? Andre, Nancy? So when thinking about what assets... VCs will invest in, we should think about why people invest in them now. You know, we've invested in software and biotech because they are the two industries in which there have been outsized returns with very low capital intensity. Um, thinking forward, that model of a power law, and by power law I mean di disproportionate returns associated with any one asset, should be applicable to a series of other asset classes, namely humans. You know, I think that VC will start to invest not only in industries, but also in people. Um, and we should be able to take stakes in the future earnings of people, particularly given the trend of, sadly, income inequality. You know, that, that creates a whole set of other problems that we should address. You know, namely, you know, are we backing some people over others? Is it, can we maintain a meritocratic environment? But I, I do think that we'll be backing, you know, all sorts of innovations in industries and also innovative people in order to subsidize their educations and would, participate in their future earnings. Would that not encompass kind of slavery then if you're investing in people? <laughs> um, well, we already invest in people, but we just invest in them really inefficiently through governments, right? Who The US spends $15,000 a year on education. So I actually think if you could subsidize educations on a more global level in order to help people that don't have access to good education and then participate in their earnings, you know, in a way that's fair, I, I think that would be hugely powerful and democratizing for, for the global population. Nancy, what's I, I would take? actually, I would very much agree with that. And for the last couple of years, I've always said when I met a founder that I didn't think maybe their business was the right business for them. I've always said, I wish I could buy equity in this person. How can I buy equity in this individual? And um, I think some students at Harvard figured out how to do it. They did it with a bunch of their classmates. They got together. One of them had enough money to kind of put a bunch of money into the pile and said, in 10 years time, we're going to split this whatever we've made to up together. And they have some sort of contract and it's still going on. Um, huh. So that was really interesting. But I'd love to see a company actually make that possible for investors to do that in individuals. Talking about the investors themselves, I'm, I'm interested, Samuli, on your thoughts on this one. Is Will it be the same class of investors that we have today in the traditional venture investors? You work a lot with corporates. What's your take uh, on that? Yeah, I think we have a, a quite an evolution and going in the space of LPs and then the need of what the, the VC should look like. So um, the, it's a lot driven to what is invested in by the who is the LP in a, in a day X. And uh, if it's a corporation who is not only looking for return 
which is the traditional VC model, he might be looking for innovation, some return, uh, some something new they get they could go after. Um, then the whole model is ch different. So it's a way longer period. Um, they, they might not just not losing money, but gaining something else, and that makes it a totally different VC than you have the existing traditional ones who have the time frame of eight to ten years to make more money and, and, and multiply it and paying it back. Um, seeing with my, our clients having these huge corporations giving the money for us, and if I, you know, I get 150 million from them, I, if I return 200, I mean, they honestly don't care because they do 50 or 60 billion revenues and, and 7 billion uh, profit. So my result doesn't really move the needle. So he's looking for totally something else in that case. I'm intrigued by one part there. You said about fund life cycles. Do you think fund life cycles are, are too short nowadays? We've seen the lengthening of time for exits. Is 10 years enough? What are the thoughts? Well, for many, uh, sorry. Yeah, for many things, it's enough. If you do a marketplace, 10 it's years is fine. Yeah. Yeah. But if you do robotics or whatever, uh, right. if you anything go into e health and we talk about medicaments or uh, medicine or anything, this kind of stuff. Then you know, ten, we ten years is just not enough. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, in any investing asset class, you get an evolution where you start with a very vanilla asset class, and over time you tailor it to have variations on that model. It's happened in private equity, it's happened in hedge funds, and the same proliferation of models is happening in VC, particularly as. The, the sources of capital become different. Corporates become interested. Endowments take large stakes. But also lots of individuals take stakes. And so the time horizons will become more and more tailored to the model and to the underlying asset class. And I think that more and more people and institutions will want to participate in the pie. Y you already see innovative models where charities participate with a VC-like model. There was a, there's, there's a guy here, a friend of mine, David Goldberg, who now gets founders to pledge 2% or more of their future exit value um, to a charitable cause. That's, in effect, VC for charity. Um, you get models which aren't structured as VC, but I, I, would, I would say that Stanford, and to an extent Harvard, are just big VC funds. Oh, they yeah. just don't call Absolutely. themselves that. Because when, when, when I turned up at Stanford, day one, they said, just so you know, we're subsidizing half of your education. If you build a big company and it exits, we would expect you to donate a significant proportion of those yes. returns to, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. to the college, yeah. to subsidize the rest of your classmates. That's VC. And so I think more and more people will want to participate in this pie, given that returns are so disproportionately concentra concentrated in a few companies and hence a few founders. Well, I think, if I could just add to that, um, I think part of what we're seeing too is that the world is becoming more and more taken over by tech. Everything has a tech layer. Everything, all the new startups must have a tech layer. And therefore, everybody wants to get into it. And, it, you know, recently, I don't know about in the Valley, I haven't been there in the last couple of months, but, you know, in, the, in London, just in the past couple of months, with the way that interest rates are changing and then the way that the foreign exchange rates are changing, a lot of um, high net worths are looking to diversify their portfolio and start investing in earlier stage tech companies. They don't want to do it on a longer horizon. So they're questioning, how do we do it? And one of the solutions that we've offered is AngelList, where they can come in deal by deal basis. But there has to be, there are going to be other vehicles that are created to create that kind of um, quick liquidity as well as interest from, you know, to basically take the interest from others and allow them to actually come into play without having to put their money directly into a VC fund. Can I ask, is that surge of liquidity fundamentally a problem? Uh, Naval Ravikant turned down the billion offered from Asia for the angel list funds and, and took 400 million because he was concerned that a billion would be too much of an injection. Is such a surge of uh, capital into tech markets a problem? I, I'm, yeah, it's go ahead. You, you go ahead. Can we hear? That's better. That's better. Shall okay. I repeat? I'd say, I'd say no for two reasons. So okay. the question was, is, is the surge of liquidity into venture capital a problem? I'd say no, A, because 
many companies are staying private much, much longer. And so the notion of SoftBank investing $100 billion in a partnership with Saudi Arabia makes sense when you've got lots of companies now that are worth you know, $10 billion plus, like Uber, that are still private. You know, and so you have massive yeah. private funding rounds. So, so I think it's a slight misnomer that there's a vast surge of, of liquidity. And the second point is that there is a surge to a degree, not vast. Um, but that surge is still lagging, I believe. It's certainly lagging in Europe. Lagging the exponential rise in interest from entrepreneurs in creating startups and hence raising, raising funding. So it's actually not that competitive, certainly in Europe, um, from an investor yeah. perspective, despite the fact that there are more funds than there were five years ago. Yeah, we have, um, we have a definitely a market here that it's still kind of the investors play, uh, and we can pretty much pick up the cases we want to invest in. And um, it, there's a change there in the market for sure. There's lots more com uh, money coming in, but there are in fact way more even startups starting. So that's what we see in Berlin happening, that we have so many early stage companies founded, and the amount of capital available for A and B rounds is just it has become more, but not in that, let's say, acceleration speed, speed as you get the new startups. And of course, then you have a globally and weird situation that we have generally just so much money out in the market because of the interest situation, because of the lack of, uh, of interesting asset classes being out there. I mean, the money was flooding into real estate because they didn't have any better ideas. Now let's see how that long that lasts. And, uh, and that's all twisting it, hopefully improving it. But it's not going to stay and it's gonna, not going to grow all the time. So it's, it's kind of a shaky times at the same time. You mentioned the companies there and their founders. I'm intrigued. We, we heard Fred Destant earlier talk about radical transparency with founders and VCs. I'm really intrigued as to how we can insert such radical transparency into potentially the more opaque VC ecosystem that, that we inhabit. N N Nancy may be better placed to answer this because she, she actually she, she's very humble and so she won't say it herself, but she actually <laughs> led the first e ever angel syndicate based fund <laughs> in Europe, um, which, which in effect leverages radical transparency. <laughs> Thanks, Andre. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess from a perspective of like what we can do to, to create this change and what we can do to kind of drive it forward, um, you know, Angelist is a really interesting opportunity. There's a lot of crowdfunding platforms out there, and um, what differentiates it, I think, is that it takes accredited investors, allows them to source deals for themselves, source deals for their syndicates, and actually take a part in that investment, um, whether it be just in putting in their money or actually supporting the company through um, for what we've provided, which is a software platform where our portfolio companies can actually access all of our investors um, and tap into their networks. And those investors can turn around and offer introductions or advice to our founders. Um, but there are, a lot of other, there are a lot of other platforms out there that do similar things and do allow people to invest maybe even like 50 pounds in something versus um, whereas we have a, 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 cap, a, a minimum that we have to invest and that you have to be an accredited investor, therefore you have to have a certain net worth or have a certain salary. Um, but, yeah. So, so I, t I totally agree. What, what does radical transparency actually mean? It means you see everything. It's like, it's like the VC equivalent of a Finnish sauna. And, and so... <laughs> In a world of radical transparency, I think, and this is where I think we're going, I think you see all the pipeline of every other fund. And I think you see all the due diligence of every other fund. I actually think due diligence becomes due diligence as a service, where we lend our due diligence to other funds. That IP becomes something that we loan, maybe people even pay for. And, and we share, and we're actually doing an, an experiment on this in terms of you know, radical collaboration. We now, with a set of other VC funds in London, share every deal we see. And, and what's the premise of that? The premise is that founders deserve more. And they deserve more in the sense that they should get the pick of the crop. It should no longer be an investor's world, it should be a founder's world. And in a founder's world, they should be able to pick the syndicate of investors that enables them to create near optimal complementarity between their investors. So they know by choosing us, they get a bunch of millennials with a young network and, and access to people that they can hire. By choosing you, they get access to corporates. By choosing you, they get access to the US. And so they build around them 
through this transparent model, a much better syndicate of investors. So kind, of, kind of an old school view that if one of the assets I have is the deal flow and I'm not willing to share it to you Don't and you all back. it in transparency as such because that makes my money work and uh, the, the investors to believe in me. I, I get your point. Mm. Um, and I have a, a, a different problematic. When I look in, in our own universe of Redstone and us collecting the data, um, yeah, I can make it transparent, but I can't make it comparable and I can't really, I really don't have all the data points. That's in fact a huge problem. So we ain't going to become this kind of open marketplace for startups because we don't have the information. We're never going to get it the way we would need it as we have in an open market as such. Um, but the, of course, we're moving more and more there. Um, but I'm, I, I'm, do not agree, Google, that far as you do, but maybe I'm too old for that. <laughs> I, I, would, I would actually, I think that's a really interesting idea to actually do that, and I know you guys are practicing it. It's what would actually take it a whole new step further was, I don't know if, if you've actually seen this, but a few startups have gotten together, and they've started creating, like, here are our due diligence documents, here, fill in the blanks. This is what we're going to send to investors. It will have everything you need in it. And so they don't have to answer our questions over email. They don't have to answer our questions over the phone. They don't have to meet with us several, several times. But you can basically just say, here's everything you're going to ask me. And let me know when you want to talk. Or even take it a step further, which one has, and sent me videos of him pitching. And if I have specific questions I can answer in that format, he writes back or he videos back. I think that's the next, not that far in the future step of what's going to happen with investment. But it's just the first step, isn't it? I mean, if, honestly, when you're investing a bit later rounds, we can gain the information, then we talk, and then we yeah. start to go out and collect the references. So that would be just a, let's say, instead of doing five management meetings, we would have one meeting and one video. And then the whole process starts again. So I, in fact, the due diligence work you have to do, at least in later stages, you, you really are not done with that. Well, so it's so much more, and there's not much I can give as a due diligence package to you, because you would do your research yourself too. But it would complement it. And oh, oh, yeah. Would, I'd find I mean, it incredibly I, I, helpful I share to all, have yours already that stuff. I mean, we, do, we have th three deals out there at the moment, and I share all the DD data we've done with the co-investors, and I gave them the package. But they say, okay, we read that through, but we need two weeks ourselves to check it all through. It's, so, it's not about that I'm convinced, but you have to be convinced, and you won't be only convinced because of I made a video, but because, yeah. I, I think it's, you're right, it's the first step, but it saves the founders a ton of time. Oh, yeah. If you can accept that as the first, like, instead of the first couple meetings, they can send you that. They save travel time, they save time with you, all those things. But it also depends on what, you're kind of, what kind of investor you are. So for us, we try and we pride ourselves in trying to make it, decisions very quickly. So sometimes we'll make decisions in 24 hours um, versus when I was at a VC. or no's? Because uh, no's we say also very fast. Investment decisions. When we say this is maybe investment yes, decisions. that so, takes time. Investment decisions. So when I was at a VC, though, it was a very different structure. So I was at a traditional VC in Silicon Valley, and that was very different than being at flight. So I think it just depends on where, who you're investing for. And the stage. Which stage you're investing in. And the stage. In, yeah. I'll give you that, too. Thank you. <laughs> so in such a founder-led world there, and talking about that investment process where the founders have the pick of the bunch of VCs, and every VC now is founder-friendly. Uh, from the show, I think I've had 600 founder-friendly VCs, <laughs> uh, which I'm sure they all are. But how can we determine the founder-friendly VCs from the not? What are, what are the tells? What are the signs? Bullshit. <laughs> Sorry, did I say that aloud? Um, yeah, I... I think it, it's, it's a people radar. It's um, how they've treated their portfolio company CEOs. Okay, can you get the people radar if you have the pre preliminary process that you just said in terms of kind of screening via video you, and community? But your question, is your question how do founders know which VCs are actually founder-friendly versus not? Yeah, okay, it is. So, I, if, you know, I'm starting my own company now. What I will do when, I'm, when I get to the stage of wanting to raise VC is I will talk to founders in their portfolio, the good and the bad, the ones that have failed specifically, because the ones that have failed know how they treat them when they failed. So what are they you know, interviewing around is not necessarily part of the VC's due diligence. It's a part of my due diligence as a founder. Mm -hmm. Andre? I think founder, founder friendly means nothing. I mean, what are you going to be if you're not fr founder friendly, like a founder foe or a founder <laughs> douche? Like, it, it doesn't make sense. But um, I think what every entrepreneur should absolutely do is 
as a basic hygiene factor, run extensive references on the VC that they're going to going to accept. Um, speak to previous portfolio founders and work out exactly how they act in a whole set of situations. But I think there's a there's a much broader question, which is, you know. I think, which underpins your question, which is, how do you differentiate? How do you differentiate today? And and uh, it might be interesting to move on to to that. Yeah. No, I think that's a very good turning point. How, how do we differentiate today? Well, our differentiation is it's a combination of us partners, three of us being in a redstone and being experienced, have some own track record as an entrepreneur, as well as then having this very special focused corporate fund. So. If you want, if you have a fintech startup, we bring one the entrepreneurial background as well as the banking knowledge from the bank itself. But we can keep them also pretty far away from you as a founder if you don't want to deal with the bank too much early on. But it has shown, and especially of course in B two B space, that that's highly interesting for everybody because the deep knowledge we can pull from there is just a it's a totally different level than any other VC could offer in that very specific space. And the combination is interesting. If you have a, some banking specialist who's been doing that for 30 years, and you get him to compare that new startup and compare what he's been doing on a daily basis, that brings interesting views on things. Um, it's feedback for the founder. It, they never tell that you have to do it this way, but it's it, it's enormous value add. I'm I'm really intrigued by one part, and it's the differentiation that a lot of investors take nowadays in terms of branding. We see the likes of Mark Suster, Jason Lemkin, celebritization of VCs. What do you, as investors, make of this rise of the VC profile, uh, which which probably people like me uh, elevate as well with the show? But what do you make of that? So you you are the VC brand extraordinaire <laughs> with three hundred thousand yeah. podcast followers. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you should probably answer the question yourself. I should, <laughs> but I'll ask you instead. <laughs> this is how you should do it, exactly. Yeah, yeah let's put that one on you. Okay. Well, in terms of the importance of VC brand. Yes, please. Yeah. I think VC brand is is now fundamental in the way that I think if you're going to build a brand by portfolio now you have to you have to wait so long you know Sequoia built a brand over decades uh, so if you build a brand you you do need to do it now through a different way than a successful portfolio is the only way uh, and I think there's many different ways you can do it specialization is one we've seen the likes of Felix Capital in London do it very well in consumer um, Atomico do it brilliantly well with the value creation team. So I think I think it's very fundamental now to differentiate through the brand as long as it's organic and, and natural, uh, which is why I centre my brand around mojitos, for instance. Uh, <laughs> so I I agree with that, um, and I think that that you and people like Mark Sister and, and Fred Wilson um, have have done something very well, which is to address an audience, which is predominantly an audience of founders. I think that there is a real opportunity. <laughs> To now address an audience that that is larger and broader, and that's because tech. If you look at any mainstream newspaper, yeah. tech is the story of the day, and it's not going to go away. And so, what is that broader audience? That broader audience is all the potential customers A, and and hires B. And I think that the next wave of VC brands will be media platforms that transcend the founder audience and, and and reach a much broader audience, which is people that are interested in innovation, not just you know VC funding rounds. But there is a different dimension to that. That's kind of exactly the branding, so that we don't know each other. You come with your startup to me, and I I take a talk with you because I did a good branding, and you wanted to talk to me. But then we get to the different level, and then it's a different ball game. So if you're a good VC, and that's also a lot of brand building, is that how I operate with you in the coming years? Because we marriage for a couple of years from now on, and uh, and if I really engage myself and I get as an investor passionate about your case, this is what you're in fact looking for. So the branding is kind of the very tiny marketing channel, but it's about the cooperation later on, which is the relevant part of it. Nancy, any any parting words on on the importance of VC brand? <laughs> Um, I would I would say that you know branding is is important across the board. It's in, it's important for individuals. It's important for founders. It's going to remain be important the more and more this um, we build our social media platforms and become more and more obsessed with our online personalities. So um, both for a company standpoint and from an individual standpoint, I don't disagree <coughs> with anything said. So finishing on brand, where can people find you if they do want to read more about Inspire, hear more about Bat or Redstone? Nancy. Uh, <laughs> um, 
I like Facebook right now because it's the least crowded of the platforms for me. So okay. Facebook friend me, I guess. Uh, we are we're very accessible, typically in uh, late night Finnish saunas. Smooly, Finnish saunas. I don't know. I've, um, I put it differently that we are starting to use the tweets to identify the companies very early on. So I think that's a very good channel. Uh, Facebook or another one. Um, I don't have the answer though. As such, we're kind of combination of them all, eh? Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It was fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.